So the next speaker is uh, Professor Marco Dentz. Marco is a professor at the Institute of Environmental Assessment and Water Research of the Spanish National Research Council in Barcelona, Spain. His research focuses on hydrodynamics, hydrodynamic flow and transport in porous media, and the quantitative understanding of flow, mixing, and reactive transport phenomena from the poor to the regional scale. His research combines theory, numerical simulation, and new data analysis strategies to shed light on the fundamental mechanisms of flow, transport, and deformation in heterogeneous porous and fractured media, and to derive theories and models for processes and process predictions at large spatial and temporal scales with diverse applications in the areas of energy and environment. He was too modest in his bio. He got the Poros Media Medal from Interpol last year. So he's a quite a, a, an impactful scientist in the field, especially on the reactive transport and transport phenomena in Poros Media. Marco, thanks very much for accepting our invitation to give this talk. Uh, thank and you very much, <coughs> Hadi, for this kind introduction okay. and for the invitation to give a talk in the summer school. Yeah, so the, the title of the talk is, as you found in the program, Mixing and Dispersion, Underground Hydrogen Storage. So I do think a little bit what to talk about exactly, I have to say. But I think I found something interesting. So of course, so I'm going to talk about mixing in porous media. So um, hydrogen storage in the pore space, not about cavern storage. Um, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about what mixing in porous media is. Then in the, in the context of uh, underground hydrogen storage. And then I want to talk about some concepts and uh, quantification like hydrodynamic dispersion and how to distinguish between actual uh, mixing processes and, and what we call spreading processes, which are important for reservoir scale modeling of, uh, of solute transport or gas transport or component transport. So first, so I'm studying very fundamental mixing. So what is mixing? So mixing is a process that homogenizes initially segregated constitu constituents, which is something that is very desired in some applications, for example, in chemical engineering. And in hydrogen storage, it is not. Um, so mixing increases the volume that is occupied by a dissolved substance. It decreases peak concentrations. This is what is very desired when you want to get rid of contaminants or of uh, um, rubbish. For example, you put it in the ocean and it dilutes. You put the maximum concentration down. And it facilitates chemical reactions. So all of these properties um, are not desired in hydrogen storage, but in many other applications. So this is just an, uh, um, an illustration of mixing of two, of two blobs of, of dye. So they are mixed. Somebody is stirring them with a stick. Um, so the fundamental process of mixing is diffusion. So diffusion, we can describe by a diffusion equation. Similar equation has been shown by Rainer before. So it's a concentration of a dissolved substance. We have a diffusion coefficient, and diffusion is driven by a gradient of concentration. We can equ uh, equivalently describe a diffusion process if we think of Brownian motion, so something maybe you are familiar with, no? so which is the, the movement of, uh, of molecules on the, or the microscopic scale, which is described by a diffusion equation, something that has been demonstrated at the beginning of the last century by researchers like Smolukowski, Einstein, Langevin. And the diffusion coefficient that is often identified with the notion of mixing essentially um, quantifies velocity fluctuations of molecules on the small scale, often stability thermal fluctuations. No? Solute molecules collide with the molecule of, a, of the host fluid, for example. So this is just an image of a diffusion process. There is a dye, and then when you let it diffuse, and it's expanding, and the maximum concentration is going down. So here, these are some um, relations that are maybe um, good to remember if you're interested in quantitative modeling. One is, what is a concentration distribution? If something diffuses, it's a, if you put in a dot of dye, 
you get a Gaussian distribution. This is the expression on the left, so it's a, this bell-shaped curve. And if you're injecting a solute, no, is a type of displacement process, then what you get is, is this type of error function, which is a second expression on the right side, which gives you a, a diffuse front. Yeah? And the width of the front, or the width of the distribution, is described by the diffusion coefficient. The maximum concentration that you have is inversely proportional to the diffusion coefficient, and it decreases like t to the dimensionality of space half, yeah? t to the 3 half in 3D. The mixing volume increases also according to diffusion and to time, t to the 3 half in three dimensions. I think is mixing by diffusion over large distances is very, very slow. Yeah? So if you think about a distance of one centimeter, and we take a diffusion coefficient of, uh, of chloride in water, which is about 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second, the diffusion time is about one day, 10 to the 5 seconds. So it's a very slow process. So if you put some sugar in your coffee in the morning and you wait uh, for it to get sweet by diffusion, you have to wait very long. So what you do instead, you stir. So normally you take type of a chaotic stirring protocol when you go with your a spoon, and um, so you have a closed vessel, and what you do is you create a, a space-filling structure. So essentially you are creating filaments, and these filaments, the length of these filaments grows exponentially in time. And then what you do is, so you are, you are spreading out your mixture, and you are creating structures that are separated by a very small distance, and then over this small distance diffusion is effective. Now diffusion is a, is a process that is most effective over small distance. And the mixing time, is now not the diffusion time, it is the time to create the structure plus the diffusion time. So now in porous media, these things are a little bit different. So I was just talking about the free fluid. No? So in porous media, we have, um, of course, we have a pore space in which things happen, can be very small. This is a barrier sandstone, pore size of 10 to the minus 4 meter. We can have gravel, millimeter pore size, and we can have uh, fractured rocks. So we have multi-scale heterogeneity, and what we do is we permeate water through the porous medium. And so these are numerical simulations in a, in a, a synthetic media here on the pore scale. It's just single-phase flow. We take the Stokes equation, we have here um, dynamic viscosity, velocity, pressure, density of the fluid, and, and uh, gravity acceleration. So here we have the, the flow field that we obtain is relatively heterogeneous no? because we have uh, um, different pore sizes and then you can think that the uh, um, transmissivity for, for water is proportional to the pore size squared roughly with pore size law. And this is a solute concentration that we obtain if we, if we start with a line injection or with a slab injection. And similarly on the Darcy scale, we have heterogeneity in the hydraulic conductivity. It's just Darcy's law that also was shown by Rainer. And uh, so here, similarly, this is the velocity magnitude, just like here, and we have a very big contrast in the flow velocities, but normally flow velocities are very slow. We are talking here about meters, so or, or maybe tens of meters per day. No? Very different from stirring in the free fluid. And, um, <clears throat> and here we have the uh, distribution of a solute concentration that we inject as a slab. So here, in a porous medium, is the porous medium that stirs, so we are not stirring, unless you, you you have some kind of an injection extraction protocol, which is sometimes um, implemented to, to promote mixing in the subsurface. But otherwise, you permeate the fluid through, the uh, velocity is heterogeneous, and what you get is you get stirring. So when we look at um, um, stirring, so this is a purely attractive uh, line that we, that we put um, through the medium, so we, we see also this creation of filaments that we saw for the, for the fluid. So, we, so um, the medium heterogeneity in the flow through the medium is creating these, these relatively con uh, complex structures, but the structures are not space-filling, because the, we say the stirring protocol is not exponential, is not chaotic. What we have is we have flow that is dominated by shear, and we get essentially um, algebraic, algebraic growth of these filaments. Uh, so the filaments are not growing exponentially, they go like linear, for example. Now when you have a fingering structure developing, or you have viscous fingering, 
the size of the finger um, increases linearly with time. And then um, microscale diffusive mass transfer or local scale dispersion is mixing locally. This is what we see here. So we have still quite some structure. So it's not like when you stir your coffee. But we get some, um, let's say we get a heterogeneous uh, uh, concentration field in which we have more or less concentrated um, areas, but we don't get something which is completely homogeneous. So the scales that are important is the characteristic heterogeneity length scale, is the correlation scale. If we are on the continuum scale, it's the correlation scale of hydraulic conductivity, and the pore scale is the characteristic pore size. And the characteristic uh, time scales are advection time, which is uh, the stirring time scale. No? Stirring time scale is so the time to create this structure is I have to go at least over one heterogeneity length scale. And the characteristic diffusion time is uh, this length scale squared over D. The two time scales are compared by the Peclet number. It's an important concept, which compares diffusion time over advection time. If you are on the pore scale, the Peclet number are on the order of one, maybe 10, maybe smaller than one. For, for gas transport, they are significantly smaller than one. But if you are on the reservoir scale, they are typically much larger. They are on the order of 10 to 1,000. Yeah? So now mixing and dispersion in the context of hydrogen storage. So mixing represents in general uh, a challenge for hydrogen, purity and recover recoverability. So we have <coughs> different processes. So we have, in principle, I mean the main process is uh, displacement of the reservoir fluid or cushion gas by hydrogen that we inject. And what can happen is the hydrogen can mix with the cushion gas. It can mix with the reservoir fluid. So mixing with the reservoir fluid is not really, let's say, a mixing process because it's relatively immiscible. No, but what happens is one creates a, a saturation. No, so, so you have locally water and, and, and gas, for example. And then when you extract it and it's, uh, let's say, mixed in, a, in, a, in the right way, you would extract both water and, and hydrogen. This is what you don't want. No, but it's not really a mixing process in the, uh, in the sense that I described earlier on. And uh, so mixing of the cushion gas with the reservoir fluid, this is actually something that would be favorable because you would um, lower the viscosity of the reservoir fluid. And this is good to prevent um, viscous fingering. And then another process that, uh, that mixing promotes is uh, chemical reactions. And this is something I think that we will Hear some, uh, you will hear something about tomorrow. So the mechanisms of mixing, which I described a little bit before, is a diffusion, of course, on the, on the small scale, flow heterogeneity, mechanical dispersion, then we have viscous fingering, convection also, because typically there is quite a big um, density contrast between the, between the gas and the, and the reservoir fluid, and we have also a capillary flow on the small scale. So what we need is we need a realistic quantification of mixing. So now I want to uh, give some, just some examples of, uh, of from the literature the, 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 uh, just to illustrate this displacement process, this uh, paper by Feldman et al. And uh, so they, they looked at the displacement in, let's say, a, a real, realistic uh, storage structure, which we have here, and they looked at gas-gas displacement, which is more or less um, uh, this type of displacement with a very dispersed interface. And then they have a uh, gas fluid displacement where you get this uh, gravity override of the, of the less dense uh, gas and the accumulation of the, of the gas at the, at the top of the, of, the, of the reservoir. And then here they made a, a study of just the horizontal displacement from gas gas. So it's um, simply an idealization of this. And then here, this uh, horizontal gas fluid displacement, where you get viscous fingering in this case, because viscosity contrasts between the, the hydrogen and the water about four or five under reservoir conditions. So these are the processes uh, that are of interest. And uh, so this is an example in the, uh, from a paper by Science Garcia. So they, they took um, the aquifer uh, or, or reservoir geometry of a, of a, of a reservoir in the Duero Basin. In, in Spain, and they did an um, injection storage production scenario in which they used essentially a two-phase description. 
um, including relative permeability, capillary pressure. And what I find is that you have some re residual saturation. Of course, each time that you, that you extract, you get some uh, hydrogen left just by, by capillary mixing, let's say. Solu solubility driving was already mentioned a few ti uh, times. Uh, is pro probably not so important because solubility of hydrogen in, uh, in water is very low. But if you consider brine, it's a little bit higher. And if you consider reservoir conditions, which is high pressure, um, it's maybe higher. So in the literature, um, there are opinions that say you can increase it by maybe one or two orders of magnitude, depending on the, on the pressure in the reservoir. Um, so now mixing this uh, dispersion again. So wh what are we interested in actually? What, what would be an observable that tells us how, how well um, is the, the thing working? No? So we have a distribution of gas saturation or gas mass fraction on the, on the left and on the right. This would be homogeneous, heterogeneous medium. So what I would be interested in is the mixing volume. No? So if the mixing volume is very big, so this means your purity, so you have a large volume in which your purity is degraded. And the mass in the mixing volume, one can calculate by this expression, is the porosity, the, the mass fraction of the gas, the gas saturation, the density of the, of the gas, and, uh, and the mixing volume. So now, the mixing volume can be quantified, of course, by the, by the width of the, of the mixing interface, but how to quantify that? No? How to quantify this mixing interface? Um, so before we get into this, just some, some, some data on, um, on, on the scenarios we look at. So here I looked at a reservoir at 1,000 meter depth, temperature of 315 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, and a pressure of 100 bar. But this, this can vary, of course. But I think probably they are more shallow, the gas reservoirs, not a, between a few hundred meters. 1,000 meters, the, the dynamic viscosity of water is 4, 10 to the minus 4 uh, pascal seconds, and the one of uh, hydrogen under these conditions is uh, about 10 to, the, um, 10 to the minus 4. So there is a contrast of about 4, 4, 5, which favors viscous fingering. Density contrast is also significant. And but as Rainer explained before, all these um, quantities, they, def they depend on the composition. No? But this is a, uh, it's a rough orientation to know what we are talking about. So flow on the pore scale, so I'm, I'm going through this uh, rapidly because Rainer has already talked about it. So we have Reynolds numbers if we, if we consider um, water density or gas density and, uh, and velocities of flow velocities of uh, meters per day and, um, and uh, pore size of 10 to the minus 4 meters. We have Reynolds numbers that are really below one, so it's very good to use Stokes equation that we have here. And uh, so for, for multiphase flow or component flow, we need to uh, specify capillary pressure at liquid gas interface, and one has to prescribe boundary conditions at liquid solid and gas solid interfaces, no? um, wetting angles and uh, everything that you need. And then uh, for transport on the post scale, is, uh, you have seen this, this equation before. So it's just a, a mass fraction density. We have an advective flux, and we have a diffusive flux on the post scale. And we have a mass transfer across interfaces. It's an interface condition. And you can, you can track the interface with a volume of fluid uh, model or with a phase field model. And uh, diffusion in the, liquid f in the li liquid phase, if it applies, we can just uh, describe with Einstein's Molikowski formula. And typically, um, diffusivity, diffusion coefficients are 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second. Diffusion in the gas phase is, uh, is more tricky. No? So because um, in, in the gas phase, if you have a um, change of pressure, and if you, have a, if, if you change um, the concentration of the gas, you're also changing the pressure of the gas, so by, just by diffusive flux, you can in, introduce an advective flux. So this is accounted for by the Stefan Maxwell theory. And I think this is what um, Rainer referred to before when he said that uh, diffusion coefficients, they are nonlinear, uh, non no? so they depend on the, on the, other, on the uh, mass fractions of the other. Um, gaseous components. So normally one, oftentimes one um, simplifies this using Planck's law and, um, and you can also use Fick's law. So there are certain conditions where you have to take into account this full nonlinear set, but in under, under other conditions it should be okay to, to take Fick's law. Now if you have a relatively dilute 
gas, of course, fixed law applies. And the uh, diffusion coefficients uh, of gas, gas, they are much higher than in, than in the liquid, about four orders of magnitude. So with this, just uh, to give some idea of the scales, um, we have now Peclin numbers for the gas, now on the pore scale, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 is totally diffusion dominated. And um, for liquid, it's 1 to 10. Uh, so there is still uh, an attraction, the dominant um, transport process. And um, now we go to the continuum scale. Rainer has also talked about it. I don't have to say much. We have the Darcy equation. Hydronic conductivity is a key quantity that I want to focus on today. It's spatially variable. We have the phase saturations, then capillary pressure and relative permeability. You, you take the parametrization that you, that you want. And, um, and then component transport um, is described by a very similar equation as on the, on the, um, on the pore scale. But now we have this dispersion term. Well, we have to introduce, of course, let's say the accumulation term is given now by saturation, uh, mass fraction, and density in the phase. Um, so now we have the diffusion coefficients. I'm not talking too much about this, Rainer, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm focusing more on the stirring and the mixing. So uh, Rainer has already given the formula for tortuosity. So of course, uh, we have diffusion that is hindered by the, by the geometry of the porous medium. Uh, so we have diffusion in a, uh, in a confined space. This is why the diffusion coefficients are typically smaller than in a free fluid. And uh, again, so now for the diffusion in gas, one takes a dusty gas model, oftentimes, or one, again, simplifies it, so you simplifies it using this Planck law or simply to the fixed law. Dusty gas model essentially treats the porous grains as a gaseous component that cannot move. No? So this is um, what is often implemented, but I'm not sure it is so relevant in, in this context that we are talking about. Um, so now mechanical dispersion in an isotropic porous medium is given by this expression. So we have alpha as a dispersivity, and V is the, is the, the flow field, no? it's the uh, Darcy flow field. And, uh, so I'm going to talk more about this in a, in a few slides down, because the um, mechanical dispersion is created by velocity fluctuations on the, on the subscale, let's say on the pore scale, or then on the, on the Darcy scale on, on, on smaller fluctuation scales. Similarly, like uh, Fikin diffusion, uh, 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 Brownian motion or molecular diffusion. And this is an expression that was derived by Scheidegger, Bayer, other people uh, in the 50s, 40s, 50s. In principle, um, this object also depends on the Peclin numbers. This is a regression that is proposed in the book by, by Bayer, Transport in, in Porous Media, Transport Processes in, in Porous Media. And now we have to say something about these, um, these passivities here. No? They, they are a key quantity. So now about scales. So now the, uh, on the, on the Continuum scale, our characteristic heterogeneity scales are on the order of 10 to hundreds of meters. Advection time is, a, is a correspondingly much larger, but also the dispersion. So now we have a dispersion time because we have an, um, an additional dispersion mechanism, which is also which is becoming a little bit smaller because these dispersivities, let's say for, for transport uh, um, of a solute and liquid, they are much larger than the diffusion for gases is different. So now dispersivities, if you are on a, on a continuum scale of, let's say, meter, few meters, then you would take the, the pore size. This is, let's say, strictly speaking, the characteristic length scale if you want to use hydrodynamic dispersion. And uh, because it's the fluctuations of the flow velocity on the, on the pore scale that cause this dispersion effect. And then, um, on the, for, uh, for the gas phase, actually, this, this dispersion effect is um, subdom subdominant compared to, to the gas diffusion. On the liquid phase, it's different. No? If you have diffusion in the liquid phase, uh, dispersion is dominating. But if we go on the reservoir scale, so what is um, typically taken in reservoir simulators, 
or in, in, the, in the models that I have uh, shown you before. So they say, okay, I have these uh, heterogeneities of the, of the scale of uh, 10 to 100 meters, so now my dispersivity is uh, proportional to this, uh, to this length scale, now tens to hundreds of meters. And then, if you do this, both in the gas phase and the liquid phase, suddenly dispersion is the dominant process. So now uh, this is just the uh, simplifications of the, of the equations that we saw just before and that uh, Reiner had shown. So if you assume that, that we have only a, a gas phase, no? so you inject hydrogen in a gas reservoir, you have only a um, saturation of gas one. Let's assume um, <laughs> density is constant. Then we just have a Darcy equation with a um, viscosity that, that varies as a function of concentration. We have a transport equation, is, attraction, is an attraction diff diffusion dispersion equation. We have mixing, is due to dispersion, for zero dispersion, actually injection and production are reversible. Also, if there would be no mixing process, of course, no dispersion, you, you would recover everything completely. So now, next process, gas-liquid displacement. Also here, let's do, um, uh, let's assume that we just have gas and, and fluid, so mass fractions are just one in each phase, density is constant, no gravity, then we can um, simplify this uh, system uh, of equations to, uh, to an equation for the, for the saturation, this is actually a nonlinear advection diffusion equation. Uh, so the, the, the drift term uh, is given by the, the total displacement times this derivative of uh, what is called a fractional flow function. And the uh, dispersion coefficient is also nonlinear. It depends on the on the saturation. So the the mixing of the gas and liquid phase, let's say the mixing of two immiscible fluids, no, is due to this um, term that depends on the on the capillary pressure. So, but also here, if d is equal to zero, so if there is no capillarity, you don't take this into account, which would, which would be the buckley leverett problem. Then you have a reversible uh, reversible um, let's say injection production scenario. So now, okay, let's go back to, to our objective. We want to um, quantify the mixing volume. Um, in these descriptions that I have shown you before, we have now decoupled the advective displacement and the dispersive mixing. And the mixing volume is just given by the, the width of this, this mixing zone, which we can quantify with diffusion and, and hydrodynamic dispersion. Uh, so diffusion acts both during injection, production, and storage, but dispersion because it depends on the velocity and the flow velocity, is only acting during injection and production. Yeah? But dispersion is, let's say, is the key quantity here, no? if you want to, to understand the efficiency. And let's have a, um, a closer look. So now I want to focus on, on dispersion, on the impact of flow fluctuations and, and spatial heterogeneity in the hydraulic conductivity. On, uh, on mixing dispersion. So we have seen that for gas-gas displacement and gas-fluid displacement, we can express um, transport with a just advection diffusion dispersion equation um, on a, a nonlinear version of it. And this nonlinear version, I forgot to say, is often linearized. So now uh, let's just look at a ca canonical model for microscale transport. So u of x would be Darcy velocity, but resolved, which means uh, typical REV scale would be a few centimeters. This is our, our um, let's say resolution scale. And um, so we have an attraction diffusion equation, and I can equivalently describe transport in terms of what we call a Langevin equation or kinematic equation, which is uh, the motion of a solute particle, and the, the ensemble of all solute particles makes the concentration distribution. So in order to quantify solute dispersion, stirring, mixing, um, the things that we are interested in and that we want to quantify on a large scale, we have to do averaging, and um, we use different types of averaging uh, procedures. We can use spatial averaging, volume averaging, or stochastic averaging. No? So this, this is um, the techniques we use, but I'm not going to, to, to talk about them in detail. Um, so now, hydrodynamic dispersion. So the concept of hydrodynamic dispersion is totally in analogy to diffusion. Um, so what one does is one says, okay, I have my uh, velocity field, which is uh, spatially variable, but now I am separating uh, into some mean, can be a spatial mean or a stochastic mean, and fluctuations about the mean, that I can write this, this Langevin equation. 
similarly to what is done for, for Brownian particles. And now one says, okay, this, um, I'm defining a hydrodynamic dispersion coefficient, which is essentially um, quantifying the velocity fluctuations. No? So these are trajectories of, of particles in a heterogeneous Darcy flow field. And you say, well, you know, you look at it and think, well, this could be also Brownian particles. So look, I, I, I quantify the, the spreading, the dispersion, in the same way as I, I quantify diffusion. So this is a formula, it's called the Kubo formula, or, or Taylor formula, as was, uh, let's say, posed by, by different researchers in different contexts. And these are the velocity fluctuations. So essentially, the uh, dispersion coefficient is a velocity variance multiplied by a, by a characteristic correlation scale. Yeah? So what happens, uh, this, this is what diffusion is. No? So a particle moves with the velocity, changes the velocity, changes the velocity. So this is this, uh, the time scale on which velocity changes. And uh, the velocity, uh, this va variance tells you what is the magnitude, no? how strong is your, your dispersive motion. So now with this concept, Based on this, uh, let's say, relatively simple concept, one can uh, explain scale dependence of hydrodynamic dispersion that has been observed in, um, in porous media. So this is um, the evolution of a plume in the Cape Cod uh, experiment that was uh, conducted in the 80s in aquifer in, uh, at, uh, at Cape Cod. And uh, what was found, so this was an experiment that was designed to, to probe what was called the macro dispersion theory. No? And what one sees is, so this was, a, let's say, a relatively instantaneous, relatively point-like injection, and normally one would uh, assume, no, if there were just molecular diffusion, no, that um, the plume length would be much, much, much um, smaller, so the dispersion would be much smaller, and um, but you get, a, you get a sizable effect. Of course, it's attributed to, to these velocity fluctuations. And then uh, Gelha and others, they compiled uh, data for longitudinal dispersion at different scales. And what I found is that the, disp the dispersivity actually increases with the scale, right? the scale that you look at. So this means if you look at a big scale, you get a lot of mixing. No? If you identify dispersion uh, with mixing, if you look on a small scale, there's little mixing. Huh? But it's not so intuitive. <laughs> So let's see, um, so if we, so this is the, the paradigm that is typically used. I say my, my fluctuation length, uh, time scale is very small, no? and I'm interested in time scales that are very large, years, uh, weeks, months, years. And then I just use this equation, dispersion equation, and I parameterize this with this dispersion coefficient that I have defined before. No? This is what, is what is used in, in groundwater models, reservoir models, no? this type of, of reasoning. Um, so I use this formula from, from uh, before. <coughs> I look what is the characteristic um, uh, fluctuation scale on the pore scale. Is the pore length divided by the mean velocity. Uh, the velocity variance is always proportional to the mean velocity squared. <coughs> and with this reasoning, we get a dispersivity, of course, which is equal to the, to the pore length of the order of the, of the pore size. Yeah, so I'm just deriving what we have already seen before. And then we go to the, to the field scale. We have macro dispersion. So here the characteristic length scale is, um, um, is much larger because now I'm going from 10 to the minus 4 meters to, to 10 to 100 meters. But also my, vel uh, my velocity variance is similar. And now my dispersivity is of the order of the, of the length scale of the... Um, of the variability scale of hydro, uh, hydraulic conductivity permeability. OK. So now let's look at the definition of this um, macro dispersion or hydrodynamic uh, dispersion in equiv equivalently in terms of moment. So before I did it in a Lagrangian frame um, using velocity, velocity fluctuations, but equivalent is totally equivalent. I can um, define them in terms of the moments of the concentration distribution. Not this it's often attributed to Aries in, in the 50s. So what you do is you, you calculate um, the second centered moment, no? which gives you basically the width of your plume. And then the derivative of that with time, this gives you the, the dispersion, <laughs> the velocity by which your mixture disperses. No? So now what we see is that 
So now, if I use now this uh, macular dispersion coefficient to, to describe mixing here, basically what I, would, what, I, what I would do is I would describe this whole thing as a relatively uniform object. No? But what we see is there is a lot of heterogeneity. It's much, um, is more mixed at the fringes and is much less, less mixed in, in other parts, but not necessarily in the, in the, in the center of the bloom, like in a, in a Gaussian distribution. Then one very important thing that I've mentioned a few times, purely advective spreading is reversible. So this is the purely advectively transported bloom, and this is the advective uh, dispersive bloom. They are very similar. So there are many reversible effects or um, features that we still have um, in advective, uh, advective diffusive transport. So now, uh, bottom line, if I ad identify mixing with spreading, and I, and I use this macular dispersion coefficient to quantify it, you are overestimating mixing a lot. No? So, so if you take this framework, you are getting an, an estimation of hydrogen mixing, which is much more pessimistic than, than it should be if you decide to take a more realistic quantification. So then, uh, ju just as a side note, when you have strong heterogeneity, there you may also get uh, what is called non fikian average transport. Um, Features, which is that the width of the of the bloom. No, normally, if things happen in a let's say in a Fikian framework, it would uh, increase with the square root of time. So, often time, what one observes is a, is a different uh, spreading rule with a different exponent. So, but the question, uh, main question is, how do we, how can we separate mixing and spreading? So first. So people have recognized that there is a problem very early, well, in the 80s. Yeah? So when macro dispersion was introduced as a, as a concept beginning of the 80s by Gelha and Exnes, Dagan Neumann in groundwater hydrology, and then already in the um, late 80s, beginning in the 90s, Kitanidi said, okay, uh, who is a researcher at Stanford, said, okay, look, there is something wrong. No, this is not the right concept. So how can we actually measure um, mixing? No? But it's more a descriptive uh, measure. So he proposed um, an entropy measure. So you, you calculate the entropy of, the, of your concentration distribution. No? You, you normalize concentration distribution, then it's like a probability distribution. You can use these concepts. And your entropy tells you about the disorder that you have in your system. So maximum disorder would be uniform distribution. No, every, everybody is equal, is, ma is maximum um, um, disorder. So then a dilution index, he defined as um, E to this uh, entropy measure, and is actually directly a measure for the mixing volume. So this gives you directly the, the, the volume that is actually mixed. And uh, when you look at the evolution of this, of this object, is, uh, is quite instructive because it, it reveals you all the, the mechanisms that, um, um, that are involved in mixing, is diffusion or, or local scale dispersion and, and the creation of concentration gradients. That's it. Now, this is what drives, drives mixing on the small scale. And um, for Gaussian concentration, you, say, um, you maximize mixing. But what you've seen before, what we have, Really, in heterogeneous medium, we don't have uh, Gaussian distributions. We have something different. So mixing is not maximum, of course. And if we don't have diffusion or dispersion, there is no mixing. It's also not a surprise. Another um, a measure, another um, um, diagnostic that you, can, that you can use if you are interested how mixed is, is a system is what is, uh, is the concentration variance. Now, if you have a very well-mixed system, your concentration variance is low. Now, if it's uniform, Concentration variance is, is zero. Now you have just a single concentration value. And um, so you can look again at evolution of, of concentration variance, and then you already see here there are two dominant effects. There is one that dis destroys concentration variance, which is diffusion, no? because diffusion wants to make everything equal. And then there is another term which is related to macular dispersion. So this is this, this term that, that, we, that we use in reservoir and groundwater models. To, to quantify mixing, but actually what it does is is a, is a, is a mechanism that, that creates concentration variability. This means it's the opposite of mixing, no? but it's stirring. So these are, these are measures that, that you can use and have been used, in, in, uh, of course, in, in fluid turbulence a lot, 
particularly these, these concentration statistics, but you, they have been used uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the recent years also for porous media. But now um, we get to a, to a concept. So these were descriptive concepts no, that I talked about now. It's, it's something that, that you can use to characterize the, the mixture. Now I want to talk about a more operational measure that you could use in a, in a model. No? So if we, if we look at this uh, distribution of, uh, of concentration, we actually see that, um, okay, I can define the width of the, of the whole mixture, which gives me this, uh, this uh, spreading measure. Or I can say, look, uh, what if I quantify um, the width along, along the vertical? And then I get a more realistic um, idea of the, of the actual width of my concentration distribution. No? And if I do this, I'm defining an, an, uh, what, is called effect, what we call effective dispersion coefficient. And um, so this spreading effect no, that, is, that is quantified by, by macro dispersion or, or this, uh, let's say, uh, direct hydrodynamic dispersion definition is quantifying the, flu the, the center of mass fluctuations of the plume along the vertical. And this is what we do not want to incorporate in our model. So now, um, effective dispersion evolves on the, on the right time scale, namely on the diffusion time scale, which is relevant for mixing, while uh, macro dispersion evolves on the advection scale. And uh, there is an approximate uh, expression that one can derive using perturbation theory stochastic and stochastic modeling, which is a relatively simple expression, which gives you a dispersivity that now evolves from a very small value at short times to, to, towards macro dispersion. No, so this means when you have a, an, uh, an injection scenario at small distances from the well, you have little dispersion and, uh, uh, or, or little mixing, and the, fur uh, the further you migrate in, the, the more mixing you really obtain. No? So you can translate here the time dependence also on the, on the space dependence. Another model, how to separate mixing and spreading, is to, to look at multi-continuum models or hybrid models, where you say, okay, I have, uh, I have two continua, for example, in fractured media, this, this is um, particularly useful. So this is a uh, uh, famous outcrop from the Bristol Channel. This is a laboratory experiment with uh, permeable inclusions. And uh, so what you get is you get a diff diffusion of, of, uh, of your solute, of your gas, in, into, into, uh, um, into an inclusion. You can, get, you can get it trapped there, and the time scales are very disparate. No? So you have transport in the, in the fraction network, which is really fast, and you have transport or retention in, um, in, in for example, in matrix blocks that are very high. So now you can write down <coughs> You can derive a transport model uh, which essentially uses this type of uh, kinetic exchange term where you exchange mass between a, a mobile, the, the fracture continuum, for example, and an immobile part. This is one way to separate. There's another way to separate um, this mixing and spreading. And then, but now I don't know if I have much time left. This is a, a lamella description. These, these are uh, descriptions that have been um, used in the, only in the last few years um, in the context of porous media, which is essentially invoking uh, the fact that if you have an interface, no, so let's say you get, you get fingering no, because of heterogeneity or because of viscous fingering. So these fingers, they grow, um, for example, linearly in time, or they grow with a, algebraically with a power law, then you can... Um, um, assign stretching to it. No? So you, you, you stretch uh, uh, a rubber or something, a rubber band. No? So what, you, what happens when you stretch a rubber band? You are elongating it in longitudinal direction and you are compressing it in the direction perpendicular. What this compression is doing is actually hindering diffusion. No? And um, hindering diffusion, but, but it's promoting mixing. So then you can, uh, you, you can um, essentially um, write down an equation for the, for the, for the width of your interface uh, by accounting for the competition between, between two processes. One is the compression of your interface by fluid deformation, and another one is diffusion. Is diffusion. So these are these two processes. You have a compression rate and you have a diffusion rate. And um, so now what happens is that the, the um, uh, mass transfer across the interface is diffusive. No? So you have a diffusion coefficient and you have a concentration gradient. 
Yeah? So the concentration gradient is essentially the, the concentration that you have in your dis displacing phase, and the, con and the concentration in your displaced phase would be zero. So concentration uh, gradient is simply C0 divided by the width of the interface. But then you have to integrate along the whole interface, no? because you are creating a lot of surface to, to dissolve something, for example. And then what you get is, is that actually the mass, let's say the, the, um, the rate of, of the solution, for example, is, giving by C, uh, is, um, is increasing in time. No? So imagine that you have a finger structure developing. This would be alpha equal to 1. So this means the mass that you would dissolve would go like t to the 3 half. Yeah? So it's not going down, or it's not constant. No? So this is something to have in mind when talking about, um, about solubility of, of hydrogen in, in the fluid. And with this, I think I, 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 I stop. <laughs> so just a, a quick summary. So what we've seen is, is mercury dispersion it overestimates the mixing volume. So one has to um, separate mixing and spreading. Um, effective dispersion, or something that I have not talked about, block effective dispersion, are concepts that can be used to do so. Or one can use multi-continuum model if one has media with very um, sharp uh, contrasts. And um, one can also use lamella mixing approaches, but, but they need still to be adapted. And uh, just some outlook what, what needs to be um, taken into account when looking at mixing. Now, I looked only at special heterogeneity, which is arguably the, the, the dominant effect when we have fluid mixing. But then, of course, we have geomechanical deformation. Um, so we need to see how uh, biogeochemical reactions and, uh, and mixing interact. Then we, we need to look at uh, realistic reservoir structure. So there will be talks about these three topics tomorrow. And um, so what is very interesting is that in, in hydrogen storage, one has this uh, injection production protocol now. And this is actually used in, uh, in aquifer tests if you want to, to probe mixing in, 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 uh, in aquifer. So it's called a push-pull test. No? So here one has actually a permanent push-pull test in order to ev uh, evaluate um, um, gas mixing. And uh, so one thing, so I'm not sure whether this has been really uh, explored, is so how important is the use of these dusty gas models or these nonlinear diffusion models for, for gas mixing. And uh, let's say the big question is to have a, a reservoir scale description that represents both the dispersion of a, of a phase and also the mixing. And this Excellent. is, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marco. <laughs> we have a few questions online, uh, people in the audience. Uh, I'm Leila Hashemi from TUDEL. Thank you very much for the very extensive and comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, actually, for underground hydrogen storage, we usually use caution gas. I would like to uh, hear about, uh, about the, if you have done any quantitative uh, compar uh, comparison between different caution gas like uh, nitrogen, CO2, or methane. Do you have any quantitative comparison between them as, uh, in terms of mixing? No, I have not done. I have not done uh, any. I, I must say, I have not done any specific study on, on hydrogen yet. So we are just starting um, our work into into this field. But I have seen in the literature there is a lot about um, um, use of different uh, Cushing gases. I, I can direct you to some papers. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, there is a question online, and then uh, before coming back to the audience, is about that you showed the scale dependency of uh, diffusion dispersion coefficient with the scale, uh, scale of the system. And that was quite an interesting graph to see that the larger the scale, the higher the, the dispersion. Now, uh, there is a question about whether when we want to do a reservoir simulation, we have the flexibility to choose the grid sizes in our reservoir scale simulation. Should we adjust the dispersion diffusion coefficient when we change the grid resolution as well? Yes. Yes, 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 exactly. Because, I mean, what, what you do is, this is by, by introducing a grid size, you are homogenizing Absolutely. everything that is the, the, the heterogeneity, which is beyond the, that grid. No? So this is why um, researchers in the 90s, like Joram Rubin and yeah. Alberto Berlin, they have developed these block-effective block dispersion concepts, where they say, I'm putting 
a fill in principle what you do is when you when you put the grid size is you put a filter on your on your um, heterogeneity field or your velocity field and they say okay the fluctuations that are let's say that the uh, the, the high frequency fluctuations I incorporate mm -hmm. in, a, in a block effective dispersion coefficient. But the problem is, of course, um, whether or not this is a, is a good description is are the time scales and the, and, and the spatial scale such that this dispersion concept is actually representing mixing or does it uh, represent simply a spreading? No? Mm -hmm. Not because I could say, look, I, I'm, I'm doing um, an, ad an advective. Yeah. Purely advective problem, yeah. no? and what you what you uh, I start with a, with a, with a, um, with a slab. What you get is you get a lot of dispersion, and I can say, okay, I, I have a block scale which is this big, and uh, I assign a dispersion coefficient to it, and then I do a macro scale model with with this dispersion coefficient. But this is like uh, introducing numerical dispersion, exactly. no? because in principle it's a fully reversible problem. Yeah. Very good. I'm sure Reiner you can ask a question. Yeah, I have a very nice presentation. I have a question related to a multi-phase flow system where you have capillary effects involved. The capillarity act as a diff diffusive part, and how do you can separate then the diffusion, the classical diffusion related to uh, the component related one, the capillary diffusion and the dispersion? How they interact with each other and how do you can separate this? Yeah. It's clear if you have a buckley levert problem, then you have your fractional flow formulation, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But if you have capillarity in, in, in the system, then you have another diffusive part and another scale, time scale. Exactly. But in principle, so if, we, if we look at component transport, in principle we can separate. I can say I'm, I'm uh, looking at a, at, a, at a saturation problem and then I use the saturation in order to to look my, at my component transport. Now I can decouple these two things. And then is the, is the dispersion, essentially, that I have in the, in the fluid phase. But of course, uh, and, and, in this, and in this case, exactly, I mean, so, this is, so we, are, we are looking into this for unsaturated media at the moment. No? So how um, a heterogeneous distribution of the fluid phase is impacting on, on dispersion, it has a big effect. But, but the only the thing, the only, well, say the only thing it is doing, it's making the fluid phase more heterogeneous than you already have from the heterogeneous medium. No? So this is that, the, let's say, the, if, if you have a, a heterogeneous distribution of the, of the um, saturation. No? But then, I mean, um, if you want to upscale the buckley level problem or the buckley level problem with capillarity, actually you get also a macro dispersion effect. And this is, has been done, I think, uh, uh, Langlo and Espedal I think in the 80s and 90s, and Inza Neuweiler, and, and we have worked a little bit on, on this as well. And it's very similar. So what you get is you get a macro dispersion effect in your saturation equation, which is proportional to dispersivity, which is proportional to the, to, to the length scale of your, of your problem. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So keep uh, more questions for the discussion panel. Thanks, Marco, very much. I have a gift for you, and I forgot the gift for yeah. Jan as well. So Mila Mine is, is not too happy with me today. So Marco, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Jan, I'll give you later on. Here. So let's thank Marco once more.